Okay, good afternoon, everybody. I hope everyone's having a wonderful day. So before we get started, I just want to mention that a preliminary version of the... Uh, that says preliminary, by the way. It sort of melted into the side of the board. A uh, preliminary final exam format. Uh, format has been posted. If you want to get a general flavor for what you should expect for this exam. It is a closed book exam. It is being proctored via proctor track. I will be putting up soon a mock quiz just to make sure that you get like it's the exact same thing I'm going to I did for the take home tests where you, it's just some questions where you can play around with the canvas tool and just do a true or false problem and a multiple choice question. They're not meant to be, it's not like a practice or anything. It's just meant to get you cozy with the way the questions are going to be formulated. Um, it'll also be set up with Proctor Track. So, so keep in mind, I recommend you do this little mock quiz I'm going to post because that'll help you make sure that the Proctor Track is all set up. If you have not done the onboarding quiz, make sure you do this, okay? It has to be done at least eight hours before the final exam. If you're ever not sure if you're onboarded or not, just take the onboarding quiz. It's on the course website. It'll be up there until the remainder of the term now. So anyways, that being said, I want to pick up to where we were last day. So first, is everybody ready for me to talk a little bit more about complexity theory? Yeah, there's no practice questions, right? I give you the format so you know exactly what you're walking into. Um, just like what we did with the take home test. Um, uh, cause I don't want you to practice for a test. I want you to understand, I'm evaluating your understanding. Um, so, so just that being said, I want to make sure you know what you're walking into when you go into this thing. That's really the objective of the format. So you know what you're going to anticipate. Um, so like when I ask you a written question, it's not going to come out of left field. It's, it's going to be something that like, okay, I'm expecting him to ask me about this and I'm going to expect me to ask me about this as opposed to be just blind signing you with a question. Uh, but yeah, so it will evaluate your understanding of the entire course. There's going to be more weight, obviously weighted towards things that we were talking more recently about because they sort of stitch everything together. But Again, I will put out in the exam format a table that tells you based on the chapters that are in the notes, how to weigh like your time. So I'll tell you how much for the, the regular languages section, how many problems are going to be related to that, how many problems are going to be related to each major part of the course. So you know roughly like, okay, where should I weigh my time reviewing for the exam? But, uh, but yeah. No, so hopefully that clarifies what I mean by I'm going to fill in some more details for you. <laughs> but yeah, no, so hopefully that clarifies that. But yeah, there's not going to be any practice questions because the whole idea is I'm going to examine your understanding. Um, I don't want to get you into the mindset that I'm just going to I don't want you to practice for the test. I want you to understand things for the test. Um, and that'll be based on the understanding you have from the course's materials. Uh, it's a little bit of a different way of viewing things. Hopefully that's understandable. Uh, but, but yeah. So if we're okay with that, I'm going to proceed now. And I want to go back to where we were last day, because I have a bunch of things I want to talk about with you today. So. Last day I ended on this note asking you, I'm hoping some people thought about this, is because last day I told you that P is a subset of NP. And last day we talked about what MP is, we did some examples. Remember though, that's the class for which we have polynomial time verifiers, which equivalently can be cast as the class for which there exists polynomial time non-deterministic Turing machines that will solve the given problem or decide the given language, depending on how you'd like to view it. So a question for you. Did anybody think about this? <laughs> is that, is it the case that, that we, that, is it that it's actually going to be where this, there's an equal bar right here? Or is it that it's a proper, su a pr so NP is a proper superset of P? So does anybody have any, insights or thoughts about this.
So if not, I'm going to proceed. Um, so this is one very, I would consider this a very interesting observation about this. And we're going to see this when we study what we're going to call MP completeness later. Is that there's going to be a whole bunch of problems. So first, every problem that's in P is in NP as well. I explained that last day. But there's some problems for which I can verify a certificate or think of it as an answer to that given problem. And I could do that and decide it in polynomial time. But some of those problems don't have efficient algorithms for them in the deterministic sense. Meaning if I give you some problem and I ask you, or think of it as a language, if I give you some input, say for example, my traveling salesman problem where I had the decision version, I give you an arbitrary graph and I and, and some number, I ask you, okay, is there a traveling, is there a TSP tour whose total cost is the most K? That, however, is a very, that's actually a, quite a tough problem. People spent, like I, I may have mentioned this, if not, uh, there are people that in my area that just study that problem. They study it like for the whole academic career. Um, it's a it's a classic problem that there's thousands of papers on it and has numerous applications in operations research, among other areas. It's a classic, you can think of it even as a scheduling problem. So, so even when you have some of these problems, there's some that are in NP for which they're best known algorithms. And I must stress the best known aspect of this, that the best known algorithms do not solve a problem in polynomial time. They typically will be exponential in their running times. Um, so if, as an example, if I give you the traveling salesman problem, uh, there is actually a nice classic dynamic programming algorithm for this. And it takes exponential time. If my memory serves me correctly. It is, I think it's, I'm trying to remember off the top of my head. It, it's definitely, it's, it's, it was authored by Held. I think it's Held and Carp, I think. If not, it's Held and Bellman. I think it's, I think it's Held Carp, I think. But I, I don't, don't hold me to that. Uh, Either way, it's one of those three, because usually they spend a lot of time studying these types of problems as well. <laughs> um, but yeah, so in these cases, we have best known running times for exponential. But that's <laughs> like, it would be nice if we had polynomial time algorithms for these, because sometimes they have, they, 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 these problems span many domains meaning that there's many, many applications for many of these problems that are sitting in NP, but we don't have polynomial time algorithms that decide those languages or solve those problems if you think about it as a decision problem. So that seems like a very interesting thing. So I, when I say that, I literally mean this. Uh, for example, I study a lot of scheduling problems and most of them that are interesting tend to be of the kind I've described. And usually they can be very bad. Like when I mean bad, like I mean like makes traveling salesman problem look easy, but that problem's already quite hard. Um, so just being, I wanna be very clear about this. There's many problems that you know about and you've probably studied in your computer science studies that their best known algorithms take exponential time and we may not actually ever know if they're if the case that they are efficient algorithms for these. And this brings me to really this question. And this is actually what P versus NP is. So you may have heard of what P versus NP is. In this course, we can exactly define it. So I've defined what P is and I've defined what NP is. We know that P is a subset of NP, but we don't know the other direction. So it's either that P is equal to NP or P is equal to NP. If you ask a lot of theoreticians, uh, I just wanna give you just an idea of the flavor of this. Uh, if you surveyed a lot of theoreticians that study this kind of stuff, most will tell you that probably P is not equal to NP. This is mostly based on evidence. It's not a formal proof, typically. And usually a lot of the techniques that people have tried to do to try to eliminate possibilities with this usually involve trying to eliminate certain kinds of proofs. Uh, for example, there's these things so-called called interactive proofs. Uh, people have studied different kinds of proofs to see if there's other ways of characterizing NP, for example. Uh, one area that's of rather interest in the last 20 or so years, at least, uh, at least 
are so-called probabilistic checkable proofs. Uh, that's another way you can actually characterize. So remember I talked about a proof or certificate? Uh, suppose you added randomization to this on top of it. So imagine you can generate the proof using coin flips, for example. Uh, there's other ways you can characterize NP in terms of things such as that. Uh, using so-called uh, probabilistic or randomized Turing machines, depending on how, which way you want to define it. Uh, this case would be a probabilistic Turing machine. Um, so there's a lot of, lot of bank on this. In fact, there's institutions that have a million dollar reward for somebody to give you a proof whether P is equal to NP or P is not equal to NP. Uh, that's, uh, for example, clay math. It's one of their big... They're big open problems. They have their list of open problems. This is one of them. And people for very a very long time, and I almost guarantee you that most theoretical computer scientists like me, like other people you may run into, will have thought about this problem at some point and had to have convinced themselves one way or the other about their own views. But the point is, is that it could be, it, we don't have a definitive answer for this, but from an empirical standpoint where people are just presenting you results about different problems, a lot of people would suggest to you that P is not equal to MP, but like I said, I can't, I, I'm, my job here is not to bias you towards the side of this debate, but intuitively it would make sense that P is not equal to NP, but who knows, we could be absolutely blindsided by a proof that says P is equal to NP one day. I don't know. Uh, the intuition is quite simple. Okay, so imagine I have some, I, I know how I can efficiently solve problems by constructing an answer for you, a yes or no answer based on generating a solution from my instance, right? That seems rather intuitive that P would contain all of those that can be done in polynomial time with respect to the input length. NP, it's not really quite like we know that you can check those or verify them efficiently in polynomial time. But like I said, there's many problems in there that it's absolutely unclear how that's even possible. Like this traveling salesman problem. It's, it's absolutely unclear how that's even done. Because remember, our, our, when I gave you that proof earlier on in the course involving deterministic Turing machines and non-deterministic Turing machines, it seemed very much caked right into the theory that like that it seemed like there's this exponential blow up in the running times. But we don't know if we can improve that construction at all. So there's some openness on how exactly you can approach this. Like many great mathematical problems, this will lead you to many avenues of research. So a lot of people like me, like other computer scientists or other, especially those that are working in theory, usually will use this problem as a backbone to study other things about theory of computation. I'm hoping, depending on how much time I have on Monday, to show you an example of this. So, that being said, has everybody got a general flavor for what P versus NP is about? So, just be aware that if you were to ask your random theoretician, usually most of them will tell, tell you that P is not equal to NP, because it's the most pessimistic situation. Because that means we're never going to find efficient algorithms for certain problems. That's, that's the most pessimistic situation you can have, right? There's another way of obviously looking at this, obviously, if you make the assumption that th that is the case, uh, some people rely on that assumption to presume that their inefficient method actually is a very effective way of doing things, such as in cryptography. Uh, some people would be like, yeah, look, look, I want to make sure, like I'm taking the most pessimistic situation uh, as an assumption. Some people rely on the assumption that there does not exist an efficient way of doing something as usually a way to cloak the, cloak the ability for somebody, potentially a hacker, for example, to break into a crypto system by finding out what the uh, keys in a crypto system might be. Um, the point is, is that if you think P is not equal to MP, that means there's going to exist this separation between P like P is going to be its own thing, but NP is going to contain all of those, but it's a strict containment. Has everybody got the general idea? So there's kind of two scenarios. One where there's something that's going to happen with NP. If they're equal like this, they collapse into one complexity class. If they aren't equal, then one's going to contain the other like a, a Russian nesting doll. So... To get some intuition around this, remember, 
you want to think about NP very much like, yeah, okay, there's going to be these efficient algorithms for certain problems in there, but there's going to be these nasty ones like this one. Um, we would like some language to convince somebody, like say if somebody poses you a question about some of the hardest problems that might be in there, which I'm going to define later, I would like to have some mechanism to convince somebody that if I give you a new problem, there's gotta be some way to convince them that my problem has to be at least as hard as some of those really nasty ones. So the mechanism we're going to use to achieve this is what we call a polynomial time reduction. So this is defined in the exact same way I talked about my mapping or many one reductions earlier in the class, when we're talking about when we did reductions earlier. So the, reduct the requirement I'm going to have is that this reduction, remember my algorithm, uh, has to take polynomial it with respect to the input length. The whole process has to take polynomial time. Implicit in this is that whatever I get when I convert an instance of pi one to pi two, the size of that also has to be polynomial because when I make this conversion process to convert over on say, for example, a Turing machine, I implicitly have to make those writes, right? Just like if you think about this in terms of something like the RAM model, every time you allocate memory, that takes time, right? <laughs> so just be aware that that is a hidden thing within this definition. So whenever somebody writes to you p, uh, pi one with this less than or equal to p, what they're saying is pi one polynomially reduces to pi two. So that means that there exists a polynomial time reduction. And remember the whole idea with our reductions is that whenever I get a yes answer, for example, for my instance that I get or construct or convert, however you'd like to say, transform. When I get a yes answer here, it has to be a yes answer for pi one. If it's a no answer for pi two, it most certainly has to be a no answer for pi one, okay? So I have a question for you. If somebody presents you a polynomial time algorithm for pi two, so meaning that it's in P, what does that mean about pi one? Did somebody tell me? It's in P as well, right? You can use the exact same box I showed you when we were doing these reductions earlier, right? Because all you do is you take my input in, my reduction, because it takes polynomial time in total, it'll then convert that over to an instance of polynomial size so that my algorithm for pi two can indeed solve it. And because this polynomial time reduction exists, when I get a yes answer, it is a yes answer for the original problem. If it's a no answer, it's a no answer for the original problem. Does everybody see that? So now when I have a reduction like this, everything stays polynomial. Does everybody see that? When it comes to the running time, that's gonna be incredibly important for us. Okay, well, about uh, other complexity classes beyond MP, just a sort of explanation. So there are other complexity classes. Uh, for example, uh, NP is the one for which we have non-deterministic, uh, sorry, non-deterministic polynomial time running times for algorithms, which means we have those polynomial time verifiers. There's other complexity classes such as EXP. These are problems uh, or languages, however you'd like to view it, for which the, uh, for which your, your decider or algorithm uh, will in fact be able to solve it within exponential time. So you can see that you'll have more classes that come out beyond this. So you'll have P, then you may have NP depending on your assumptions uh, about where it is within that. And then you'll have X sitting way out there. There's other complexity classes like this. So, so for example, if I give you P, like if I, if I assumed P was not equal to NP, you would have P, and P, and X would be way like out here. So X contains all sorts of fun games. Uh, if, you're, if you're familiar with game theory, there's a lot of different kinds of games that exist in that class over there. Uh, so if you're, in, if you're one of these buffs that really likes trying to find algorithms for checking games on checkers or chess or other things like that, they oftentimes relate closely with X. But yeah, a lot of like problems with combinatorial explosions that are usually because the output itself requires exponential size, they also oftentimes relate closely with exp. 
but believe, be aware there's other complexity classes. There's a, the, the, word, the phrasing that some people would use is there's a complexity zoo. There's a whole different bunch of these complexity classes. People try to put them into buckets to classify them. Just like a zoologist would go around looking at animals and try to classify them. That's the exact analogy I would probably use to describe this. So when theoreticians like me that are interested in algorithms and complexity go around, what we do is we try to put them into these buckets to try to figure out which ones are the easy ones, which ones are the harder ones. So often when you're studying a problem from more of this, this fundamental standpoint, if you're interested in knowing if it takes efficient, it takes polynomial time or not, normally what you'll do is you'll try to sit down and try to prove or determine what complexity class it sits in before you even design the algorithm. So it's really one of those two-sided things. Somebody might design an algorithm for you, but they may try to show you that this algorithm actually works really well, like it's really efficient, because they'll complement her on a complement side, they'll show you that it belongs to a certain complexity class. That now will be the motivation that they will use to say that this algorithm is actually quite good. That's very much the pragmatic reason that, and you'll find very often this is a good research strategy. So if somebody's giving you a problem, it's usually a good idea to try to motivate somebody why that problem is interesting. One very powerful way is to classify it like this. So I'll give you a mechanism to do this that's really helpful. And that's where I'm going to be going later on in this lecture. <laughs> so hopefully that gives you an idea. There's a, there's a large list of these. If you ever go on a search engine and type in complexity zoo, uh, you will probably find a wiki that contains a giant list of these. Like there's just a ton of these. There's ones for randomized complexity classes. There's ones for quantum complexity classes. For if you want to talk about a quantum Turing machine, there's ones, there, there's a lot of these classes. So just to be aware, like these are not the only game in town. So I appreciate you asking me that question because it gives me a nice transition to talk about this kind of stuff. And I must stress that in today's theoretical computer science world, just being the hardest of the NP problems may not necessarily be the, mo the best justification. It's just a good starting point these days. But in different areas, being the hardest of the NP problems might be a pretty good place to motivate somebody. But either way, categorizing your problem into one of these buckets is usually a good strategy. This is just a little bit of advice because oftentimes researchers will use this to help motivate why they need to use a certain approach. So for example, if you know it's like really tough to solve, maybe it might be a good idea to prove that's the case, at least under certain complexity assumptions. So I wanna do an example of a polynomial time reduction with everybody. I'm gonna put more details about how you prove the result I'm going to give you in the notes. So if you wanna read the whole proof, you can check it out there and I would like you to do that because it's important that you see what the proof would look like, but we're sort of, I got to keep an eye on the time for us because there's a couple things I want to show you still. So anyways, I'm going to introduce you to another decision problem. This is what we call Hamiltonian cycle. I'm going to abbreviate it as HC. So I'm going to imagine I'm given an undirected graph, a G, which is going to have vertices and edges. And I'm going to assume that N is just going to be what the number of vertices is. I'm going to ask you if G contains a Hamiltonian cycle. And you want to know what a Hamiltonian cycle is? It's just simply a simple cycle that contains every vertex in the graph. What does simple mean? Just don't repeat any vertex. <laughs> That's what it means. So I want to do an example of what one of these would look like. I, I can assure you that this, in fact, has a Hamiltonian cycle. Can somebody tell me a Hamiltonian cycle that exists in this graph? Can somebody tell me one Hamiltonian cycle that's in this graph? Okay, so we got zero. So I, this is exactly the one I was thinking of. Zero, three, four. We've got zero, three, four. Then we go to one. Then we go to two. And then we go back to zero, right? So notice that if I take this cycle around, if I start at zero, I can come right back to zero and I've visited all the vertices. Does everybody see that? I must mention this whiteboard marker smells like cherries. It's actually quite, it smells quite good. Just don't go huffing whiteboard markers typically. These ones are scented. 
It smells like cherries. <laughs> Just don't go off in normal ones, okay? <laughs> I, I hear that's not very good. <laughs> um, so this is an example of a Hamiltonian cycle. Now, I can tell you straight up that the most efficient algorithms we know for this problem take exponential time for, any for an arbitrary graph. Now, I have a question for you. Because we talked about NP last day, eh? what would be... So first, is this problem in NP? Can somebody tell me? And if so, can you tell me what the certificate should look like for this one? What can a certificate be for this problem? Yes, it is. Very good. And what would the certificate look like? Like what would like if somebody came along to you and said, "Hey, look, I have a yes instance to this to this problem. Uh, can can you like prove it to me? What would be an ideal certificate? What would it look like?" It should be a cycle. If we want to be very optimistic, I must mention that usually when people talk about certificates, usually they're very optimistic about it because they normally say, hey, look, yes, it is. It is. It has to be. So if you told me, yes, a cycle or a Hamiltonian cycle, either one I would accept just fine. But I like to prefer saying cycle because it just it makes things a little easier for you to convince yourself that you have some way of checking it's a Hamiltonian cycle. But yeah, so I'll just say, yeah, the certificate for this one would be a cycle, right? So all I have to do then is I can just simply design a verifier that runs in, pol in polynomial time. Can somebody describe to me what that verification algorithm would look like? What is that polynomial time verifier going to do? I'll give you a hint. It's very similar to the one I showed you last day for, for another problem. It's just like it's just like that one. So what did we do there? Uh, well, I guess tell us how you would adapt that for this. Yes, yes. So what we do is we just simply follow the edges of the cycle. So we just check if the cycle contains all the vertices and doesn't repeat one. And that's all we have to do, right? Because that's what a definition of a Hamiltonian cycle is. So if that is indeed the case, it passes that test and we say it accepts, meaning it's a yes instance. Otherwise, we reject, which simply means that my guess or certificate had to have been, the answer is no, I, I, I don't trust this proof. <laughs> it's, just, it's a bunch of nonsense. <laughs> Does everybody see that? So you can see the Hamiltonian cycles in NP, right? So if that's the case, I'm going to describe to you now a word polynomial time reduction that will take me from Hamiltonian cycle to my decision version of TSP, which is a very natural thing to do. Uh, so I'm going to so I'm going to present you a way that I'm going to take one of these instances. I'm going to translate it into how I would describe an instance for this TSP. Now remember, the whole idea here is that I'm going to have a reduction. Now remember, the yes answers are going to need to map over to yes answers. So remember, you got to keep this picture in your mind. This is a very important picture to help you do this. So if there's yes answers here, and there's no answers. So suppose I have Hamiltonian cycle here, and I have TSP decision over here. So remember, when I have a description of a potential, potential Hamiltonian cycle, it's going to give me a yes answer. So this is just saying yes. I, I didn't have space to write yes with quotation marks. So for all of these, all the ones that are yes answers, we want to convert those over to an instance of this problem such that the answer is yes. Likewise, when I have the no answers, I want to convert those over to something that looks like a no answer. There may be, of course, cases where you're going to end up with stuff that makes absolutely no sense. They might sit out here somewhere. We don't care about those. It's quite trivial to say, hey, look, that doesn't even look like a graph, so let's just reject. <laughs> so you just create up a really dummy example where it's just like, it will never have a Hamiltonian cycle. Those aren't very interesting for us. So usually we'll just lump those in with the no instances. 
So just keep this picture in your head. So whenever I do these reductions, it may not necessarily be the case that they're gonna, there's always going to be some correspondence between the S's and the S's, meaning there's always one for the other. In some problems, it will be the case. Many of they will not be the case. In fact, what you usually like to do is you like to take one of these yes answers, turn it into something that's really specific and has a very specific structure so that I can always tell and prove something about it so I can connect my first, my problem of interest to the problem I already know and have studied and see that it's actually kind of tricky. So let's do the reduction. Let's do the reduction. I was about to sing a song, but I don't want to make anybody cringe too bad. Okay. So, you believe it or not, this reduction is actually going to be very natural for this problem. So, very often the way that this is going to play out is that you would like to have it so that, remember, our goal is I give you an instance of a Hamiltonian cycle. So I'm just going to assume it's a description of a graph and, and that's it. Like it's just some description of a graph. And I'm going to use this reduction to transform it into an instance of my decision version of the traveling salesman problem. So that's going to be my job and it has to run in polynomial time such that when I get yes answers for my TSP instance, it has to produce yes answers for the Hamiltonian cycle uh, problem. And when it's a no answer, it has to be a no answer over there. Okay? Does everybody understand the game plan? Okay, if we understand the game plan, let's proceed. So, so given, uh, given an instance, of Hamiltonian cycle with graph g is equal to ve. We build, I'm using the word build, I like to think about it like we're building an instance, although technically in the reduction we're transforming the input into input for another problem. I just like to think about it like I'm constructing something. Because that's very much how it feels like when you're doing these kind of reductions. Uh, we build in polynomial time a weighted complete graph. So remember, a complete graph, remember, Every vertex is adjacent to every other vertex. There's some edge that connects each one of the vertices to every other one. And we say it's weighted because it has numbers on the edges. I'm going to call it H, where it's vertices. I'm going to call N for nodes, and F is just going to be my other set of edges, as follows. So you're going to see how I'm going to build this is just like when I did reductions earlier, I'm going to describe to you how I'm going to transform that into H. So I'm going to take G, I'm going to, I need to give you H and I also have to, uh, I guess technically I also have to tell you a K, right? That's sort of implicit in the way I'm going to do this. Uh, as follows. Assuming, so I'm going to assume that the edges in H starts off as empty, just because it makes it a little easier for me to describe it to you, because I'm going to construct H using a process. So here's the first step. All you're going to do is you're going to let the set of vertices of H be in fact equal to the same set of vertices that we had for G. You're just going to make them the same. That's the first step. It's the easiest one. And now all we're going to do now is we're going to look through each one of the pairs of vertices and see if there's an edge that exists in G for it. So let me, let me draw you a picture. So I'm going to take that example I had on the board there earlier. This is a really, it's one of these standard tricks that people like to use with problems involving TSP or other kind of routing problems. So let me just label these again. 
two, three, and zero. So this is our input graph G, right? That's what G looks like. So when we do this reduction, just kind of like what we were doing with our undecidability proofs, we like to make the, the thing I construct, this H over here, have a very specific structure so that I can try to use an algorithm, imagining there's some algorithm for the traveling salesman problem that I can make it look like something has a very special property. So under that specific assumption, there should be a direct parallel between the two. So remember, I'm building H from G. So H is coming as a result of G. So here's the first idea I have. So what I would like to happen is something like this. So imagine I have all of these edge weights. I'm gonna assign edge weights to all of the edges so that all of these edge weights are equal to one. Could somebody tell me what would be the, if I were to sum up the edge weights that I have on here, what would the, what would my uh, Hamiltonian cycle, what would be the sum of all of those edge weights? Could somebody tell me? What's the sum going to look like? When I do my Hamiltonian cycle, when I go through this, What is this going to total to if I tell you the number of vertices is n? It's n. It is. It is exactly equal to n. So here's the idea I have. This is my suggestion what we try doing. We try to make it so that we try to force the traveling salesman problem instance to try to find a relatively short path so that if it picks a bad edge, I'll define what I mean by that in a moment when I give my construction here. Because remember, this isn't a complete graph yet, right? There's some places like, there's no edge right here, for example. Um, what I would like it to do is force, if I gave you an algorithm for the traveling salesman problem, I want it to force using these good edges and I want to punish it if it uses a bad edge. Meaning a bad edge is simply one that is not in the graph. So that's going to be the trick that I'm going to employ here. So in the second step, I'm going to consider all the pairs uh, for each. So I'm going to take each one of these. I'm going to consider like four and zero, zero and one, zero and two, zero and three. And then I'll do this for all the pairs of them. And I check if there's an edge in G. For each pair, U, V, in V. So in the first case, I'm going to do exactly what I described over here. If, if there's an edge UV in this graph, all you're going to do is you're going to add edge UV to F. Remember, F is my set of edges for H to F with weight 1. Remember, these are the ones that I would like a TSP tour to use. Keep in mind, there might be more edges and there may exist more Hamiltonian cycles, but we want to make sure if there exists one that the TSP tour, that the best one I can find based on how I construct this, you're going to see in a moment, I want to make sure it takes the one that gets me a TSP tour and punish it if it takes an edge that is not in this graph. Because remember, when I encode the traveling salesman problem instance, it may, it's a complete graph. So I have an idea. So now I'm going to consider this other possibility. So suppose that UV, suppose this isn't an edge in the graph. So here's an idea. Suppose I try to make it so that if you take an edge that isn't in G, so remember, these are now edges in F. I consider all the edges that I have not accounted for. So I have one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. I think I think I got them all. I got all of them. Now this should be a complete graph and I've summoned the occult here. So, so now 
what I've got to do is I need to assign weights to these edges. Do you see that so some people would call this what we call an edge completion? Wherever there's edges, I, do, I try to introduce a new edge. This is a common technique when you're studying problems involving the traveling salesman problem. A uh, common way, another way of doing this is that you just simply sum up all the edge weights and you try to make that a number. Or if you're doing something on an actual Euclidean space, like meaning actual physical distances, you would actually try to calculate out what this distance would look like geometrically. But for our purposes here, all we need to do is assign this to be big enough that it causes us a problem. So suppose I make this edge two for its weight. Could somebody tell me why that's okay? Is that big enough? Yeah, so now if you notice, now this th that's exactly it. So notice that if I pick this edge in my TSP tour, that's a no-go, right? Because you remember, it consists of n vertices in the cycle, right? So if I pick this bad edge here, it's sum of the length of it is going to be at least n plus one, right? So that's going to be what we're going to do. We're trying to make it so that if, if I then try to use an algorithm based on TSP, if I pick one of these bad edges, I know that there cannot be a Hamiltonian cycle if it's too long. Does everybody see that? So I'm going to assign twos to all of these. And that's also what I'm going to say over here. If this is not in G, you're going to add edge. You're going to add this to F. And it's, we're going to make its weight two. Keep in mind, I must stress that you can also make it so that, that that weight is even much bit larger. In fact, there's exist reductions where you make that at least say, at least the sum of all the edge weights plus one, or I think you can get away with n plus one. Um, some reduction techniques take advantage of that fact about this particular one. Now, I haven't told you what k should be. So I'm going to just make k equal to n. And that's all this polynomial time reduction. This is the description of the reduction. Is everybody okay with my description of the reduction? So now notice that I could tell you how to build or transform my Hamiltonian cycle instance into a traveling salesman problem instance. But if you were to take this, you should be able to see that you could do this all in polynomial time. I'll leave that as an exercise for you to think about. Typically, when people present these to you, usually they're written in a way that it's very easy to see that it runs in polynomial time. But if it's non-trivial, you usually have to prove it. But I must stress that if you were to take this usually using a typical analysis of algorithms type of approach, you'd probably say that this takes quadratic time with respect or even takes linear in the vertices and the edges. However, you'd usually say something like that this takes... It takes quadratic in the number of vertices. But for our course, we're not going to worry so much about that. For me, it's good enough to just see that it actually, this should, it's written in a way that's very easy to see that it runs in polynomial time. Is everybody okay with that? So if I asked you on the exam to give me one of these reductions, I don't ask, I don't, will not expect you to tell me what the time complexity of it is. I'll just see, expect you to write it out in a way that it makes sense that it would run in polynomial time. Okay, so this is all the this is this is this is the algorithm that will get me these instances. Now here's the theorem that gets you the connection between the two. So this will complete the reduction. There is a Hamiltonian cycle. There's a Hamiltonian cycle in G, if and only if H has a TSP tour with total length at most n. So if you so notice that this theorem just straight up tells you that if you get a yes answer for this TSP instance, 
that it is telling you that there is a Hamiltonian cycle. Likewise, if, if you don't have a TSP tor, because of the if and only if relationship we have here, that guarantees you that there is no Hamiltonian cycle. Does everybody see that? That's why we have both directions in the logic here. So I'll ask you to read the proof for this one. Now, is it okay if I take a few minutes of your time? Because I want to talk about one other thing before we leave today. If it's okay, let me, let me quickly write this down. Because I, I really want to make sure we touch upon this today. Because on Monday, we may only have time to do some more examples. And I would much rather I show you some big ideas. So that's an example of a polynomial time reduction. And this is your main mechanism for if you give me a problem and you, th and like notice that these reductions, they guarantee you if say pi two, in our case, if our TSP, if hypothetically speaking, if I give you a polynomial time algorithm for TSP, hypothetically speaking, I think that's very unlikely you're gonna find such a thing. It's a really nasty problem. Um, then you can have a polynomial time algorithm for Hamiltonian cycle. Like I said before, you can almost view the reduction like it's a generalization of the original problem, just I've written it in a different way. So, that brings me to talking about something that I would consider the key piece to all of this. We're gonna talk about what MP completeness is. So, I must have first define the concept of MP hard. So, I'm just going to mention that there are hardest there are hardest problems in NP. So I make I've been making this presumption earlier on in the lecture, but this actually is a thing that there exists hardest problems in NP. So one port of techno technic one ter I'm getting really tongue tied cuz I'm very excited to show you this. Uh, first Uh, first, to describe, uh, describe, uh, describe problems that are at least as hard as every problem in MP we define NP hard. So I'm gonna first define what we call NP hard. And then I'm gonna define something called NP complete. So first NP hard, now this is gonna, uh, when I must stress, at first this is gonna look very strange because we haven't seen anything like this before. But I assure you it, it's gonna fit every, it fits into everything I've been talking about the last couple lectures. So a language or problem, it's a language or problem pi, um, is NP hard, is NP hard if for every, for every pi prime in NP, so for any language that's in NP, there exists a polynomial time reduction that takes me from that problem in NP to pi. So, there's a, so every pi prime here is polynomially reducible to pi. So I could take any arbitrary language that's in NP and I can show you there's a polynomial time reduction to this problem, pi. So, so that's the first piece of this. So first, is everybody okay with this definition? It looks a little strange because now I'm talking about an entire complexity class and I'm saying like, oh, you can pick off any one of these and there's a polynomial time reduction for it. It seems like magic almost. <laughs> it sounds like something that would be like, yeah, that seems kind of incredible. Like how can you translate every one of the problems in NP to one of these? It seems very strange, right? But it actually is a very real concrete thing. So, so the hardest problems in MP are 
and P hard. That defines NP complete. So NP complete. So somebody asks you what an NP complete problem is. It is a decision problem or language, however you'd like to view it. Remember that line has been blurred quite a while ago. Uh, language pi is NP complete if well, the following two conditions hold. That pi is in NP and two, pi is NP hard. Now, I need to blow your mind with one th quick thing before we go. I'm going to present a very strange theorem to you that's going to make complete sense if you understand what we talked about today with a polynomial time reduction. Here's the theorem. And I wrote the proof out in the notes if you really want to give it a careful read. That's a little squeaky there. So here's the theorem. If, if some, if some NP complete, if, it, if some NP complete problem pi is in P, then P is equal to NP. Wild, right? <laughs> so I'll let you think about why this is true. I have the proof. It's going to be in the notes after class. So you can take a look at that if you're not convinced by this statement. When we come back, we'll talk a little bit more about MP completeness. We'll do another example and we'll see how much time we have. I'm hoping I can give you one more example that'll show you another way you can use these reductions. So I'll say thank you very much and have yourself a wonderful weekend, everybody. I'll see everybody later.